Hello everyone! We are in Rome and today we continue the series of walks through this wonderful city with four more places that you can visit for free. If you like our videos, don't forget to click that subscribe button to learn even more interesting things about the next place you're thinking of visiting. The Palatine Hill and the Roman Forum aren't the only archaeological parks in Rome. There actually are several archaeological parks that you can visit for free in Rome, and we will take you on a walk through four of them. We'll see together Parco del Colle Oppio, Parco degli Aquedotti, Villa Doria Panfili, and Parco della Pia Antica. These are only a few of the parks that you can visit in Rome. The first park that we'll be visiting today is the Parco del Colle Oppio, a small park near the Colosseum, which stretches over the area of the hill with the same name. The park was created in the context of Rome's urban planning program during Mussolini's era in 1871, when the urban planning necessary to meet Rome's new needs began and the area was earmarked for public gardens. In the park are Nero's Pavilion, the Domus Aurea, the Bots of Titus, and the Bots of Trajan. The Bots of Trajan were a huge bathing and leisure complex built in ancient Rome, inaugurated under Trajan during the calends of July 109, shortly after Aqua Traiana was built. Commissioned by Emperor Domitian beginning in 96 AD, the Bath Complex occupied a good chunk of the southern side of the Oppian Hill on the boundary of what was then the main developed area of the city, although still within the boundary of the Severian Wall. Early Christian writers were thought to have mistakenly called the remains the Bats of Domitian, but this proved to be a correct attribution to the emperor who started the project, even though Trajan completed the work with the help of the architect Apollodorus of Damascus. With an area of about 11 hectares, the Colle Oppio Park is a real pearl of the Monti district and a real archaeological park, from which we can admire the Colosseum and the Palatine Hill. And if you want to see these places up close, once you're done watching this video, check the links in the description or in the card above to see our videos from the Colosseum, the Palatine Hill and the Roman Forum. The first core of the park was actually built between 1928 and 1932 by the architect Raffaele De Vico. The arrangement of the upper part of the hill, including the ruins of Trajan's Baths and the Seven Halls, a gigantic cistern that supplied the Baths, was instead handled in the following years by Antonio Munoz, director of antiquities and fine art in the government of Rome, who favored the search for spectacular perspectives at the expense of the overall vision of the monumental complex. The garden develops along two main avenues, Viale della Domus Aurea, and Viale Mizzi, equipped with monumental entrances and enriched by a series of fountains that give the park a romantic and evocative aspect and which were created by exploiting the natural slope of the place. Among them the Fountain of the Amphoras and the Fountain of the Nymphs need to be mentioned. The vegetation of the park is made up of a pleasant combination of Mediterranean plants, such as pine, oak, cypress and oleander, exotic essences typical of landscape gardens such as palm trees and species typical of ancient gardens such as roses, myrtle and laurel. From here we'll go to Parco degli Aquadotti, an urban park in Rome located in Municipality 7 with an area of approximately 240 hectares and part of the Appia Antica Regional Park. The name derives from the presence of seven Roman aqueducts that supplied ancient Rome with water, Agno Vetus, which is underground, Marcia, Tepola, Iulia and Felice, which are superimposed, and Claudio and Agno Nuevus, which are superimposed. 
In the past, the area was known as Roma Vecchia from the farm of the same name, and it lays between the Apio Claudio district to the northeast, Via delle Capannelle to the southeast, and the Rome Casino Napoli Railway to the west. The Villa delle Vignacce, or Villa of the Wineries, was one of the largest southern suburbs of ancient Rome, located on Via Lemonia in Parco degli Acquadotti, or Aqueduct Park. Built in the 2nd century AD and renovated in the 4th century, it still remains one of Rome's least documented villas, despite the extensive ruins that are available in Rome's largest public park. Based on the markings and the masonry studies, the construction of the luxurious villa is attributed to Quintus Severius Purans, an extremely wealthy friend of Emperor Hadrian. Of the remaining structure, there is a large circular hole that was covered with a dome. The villa represents one of the oldest examples of amphoras used to illuminate interior areas. The American Institute for Roman Culture, together with the American, Canadian and Italian students and professionals, excavated in the summer of 2006 and unearthed the ground floor of the villa four meters below the modern street level. The bath complex which was discovered had mosaic floors and marble walls, as well as a perfectly preserved ancient underground heating system. Rare glass-paced mosaics from the 2nd century AD have also been found, which had collapsed onto the ground floor. And in the summer of 2007, excavations revealed that the two-story complex covered more than 5 hectares and contained hot rooms, vaults, cloakrooms and marble latrines. And the inside of the complex was decorated with statues and waterfalls. About 150 meters away from Villa delle Vignace, to the southwest, the remains of a large oblong cistern built out of brick are visible. It is arranged parallel to the route of the Felice Aqueduct, which at this point replaced the Marcio Aqueduct that originally supplied the villa. The cistern, considered a true Castellum Aque, water castle, with a trapezoidal shape, extends over two floors and has two rows of semicircular niches on the outside, while internally it is divided into three rooms on the lower floor and four on the upper floor. Nearby is the Felice Aqueduct, which reaches the Fountain of Moses, and owes its name to Pope Sixtus V, Felice Peretti, who built it in the 16th century. Designed to supply water to the Viminale and Quirinale areas, the aqueduct was built according to a project by the architect Matteo Bortolani. Later, the work was completed by the architect Giovanni Fontana, who was also the author of the Fountain of Moses. With a length of 24 kilometers, the aqueduct reaches Fontana dell'Acqua Felice, also called the Fountain of Moses, on the Quirinal Hill. Next to the Aqua Claudia aqueduct, we can see the Poggio Galliella Tumulus, which is one of the Etruscan tombs of Chiusi, located near the city. It is a one-chamber pillared tomb, thought to date back to the first half of the 5th century BC. Traditionally believed to be the tomb of King Porsena, who besieged Rome in 506 BC. Parallel to the Felice Aqueduct, we see Aqua Claudia, which was one of the old Roman aqueducts, like Aqua Agno Novus, started by Emperor Caligula in 38 AD and finished by Emperor Claudius in 52 AD. It was the eighth aqueduct to supply Rome, and along with the Aqua Agno Novus, Aqua Agno Vetus, and Aqua Marcia, is considered one of the four great aqueducts of Rome. It is one of the two ancient aqueducts that flowed through the Porta Maggiore, the other being Aqua Agno Novus, and is described in detail by Frontinus in his work published at the end of the first century, De Aquaeduct. 
Nero extended the aqueduct with the Arcus Neroniani to the Caelian Hill and Domitian further extended it to the Palatine Hill, after which the Aqua Claudia was capable of supplying all 14 Roman districts with water. The aqueduct has undergone at least two major repairs. Tacitus suggests that the aqueduct was in use until 47 AD. An inscription from Vespasian suggests that the Aqua Claudia was used for 10 years, then was unused for 9. The first repair was made by Emperor Vespasian in 71 AD and was repaired again in 81 AD by the Emperor Titus. We found the remains of an ancient Roman building, on which stands a medieval tower, that was once part of a guardhouse of the Casale di Roma Vecchia. The structure consists of a square-shaped cistern made of flint concrete, and the interior of the building is covered with a vaulted ceiling. Considering the proximity, it can be assumed that in antiquity the cistern was fed by the Claudio Anno Novus aqueducts. On the side of the tower there is still the ancient pavement and part of the side walls which were probably part of other buildings adjacent to the tower. We also see the Martius aqueduct which was one of the largest Roman aqueducts, built by the praetor Quintus Martius Rex in 144 BC. The springs from which the water is collected are located in the upper Aniene Valley near Arsoli, and since ancient times Aqua Marcia has enjoyed a reputation for excellent water. Long sections of the aqueduct were destroyed and used to build the Felice Aqueduct, and its arches are still visible in Torre Fiscale at Mandrione and between Porta Maggiore and Porta Tiburtina. The Aqua Marcia underwent major restoration work under Agrippa in 33 BC and Augustus between 11 and 4 BC. The later, in particular, improved the flow of the conduit by capturing a new source called the Augusta. The restorations of Augustus are commemorated on the bridge of the Tiburtina Gate where the later ones carried out by Titus in 79 AD and by Caracalla in 212 to 213 are also commemorated. With the construction of the great baths of Diocletian fed by Marcia's waters, it was necessary to build an additional channel. Restorations from that period can be found along the pipeline, while epigraphic sources also document interventions made by Arcadio and Honorius. Water from Marcia reached ten regions. The Caelian and the Aventine were fed by the river Herculaneus, which broke off from the main branch just before the Porta Tiburtina and reached the Porta Capena through an underground pipe. Next to the aqueduct, we find a beautiful artificial lake that is fed by the aqueduct. We arrived at the Villa Doria Panfili Park, a 17th century villa and what is today the largest landscape public park in Rome. Located in the Monte Verde district on the Gianicolo or Roman Gianiculum, just outside the Porta San Pancrazio, within the ancient walls of Rome, where the ancient road of the Via Aurelia begins. It began as a villa for the Panfili family, and when the line died out in the 18th century, it passed to Prince Giovanni Andrea IV Doria and has been since known as Villa Doria Panfili. At the entrance to the park, we find natural places to relax, cycling and jogging paths, and places for bird watching, and a pond fed by a small well where we can see turtles. And from here we go to Casale Giovio, an important funerary testimony from the Roman era, located in the western sector of Villa Doria Panfili. Renovated at the end of the 18th century, it was, in its initial phase, a small temple-type tomb of the imperial era. The ancient building consists of a rectangular hall with access from the west, at a distance of about 140 meters from Via Aurelia. 
what remains of the tomb is better preserved on the north side and is part of a wall with a curtain of brick characterized by a chromatic variation that goes from dark red to yellow. The first floor and the part added to the end of the west side are modern additions, the latest being probably built on the cement core belonging to the access steps of the ancient tomb. From here we go to the other side of the park crossing over a bridge. The park has an area of 1.8 square kilometers and is divided into two sections by a road built for the 1960 Olympic Games as part of the Via Olimpica. A rustic building built between the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the next century, based on designs by Francesco Bettini. Altered in the 19th century by Andrea Bussiri Vici, it houses the Bel Respiro Elderly Center. In the park is a very beautiful lake, Lago del Belvedere, which is of natural origin and over the years has undergone numerous changes and enlargements, without any increase in water supply. The recent development of the lake has improved the flow and output of water, reorganized the historical parts and created three viewpoints. It is one of the most beautiful spots in the park. The lake is beautiful, with water coming down from a small reservoir at the base of the Giglio fountain from several pools. On the lake you can see ducks and swans, and in the lake you can see huge fish and turtles. About halfway down the channel we find a small artificial cave, built to pass under the water falling into the Lake Belvedere, with various openings to see the water falling from above. Under the embankment is the Cascada Fountain, consisting of a complex of basins connected to each other, which flow into a small lake. The route begins with an excedra that is divided into three niches on each side that once contained statues, interspersed with rough stone pilasters and pillars. Water flows from a rock in the center of the excedra and collects in the poof, from which then it falls into another, forming a first waterfall on the face of the rock. Another difference in height is determined by a very refined articulated stone wall with a rounded upper edge. From this basin the water widens into a large lake called Del Giglio after the fountain of the same name that adorns the terrace. And a little bit higher we find the beautiful Giglio fountain, designed by the architect Algardi. Built at the beginning of the 18th century, this fountain is supplying the lake with water. While walking through the park we found this gorgeous fountain that represents the Tiber River, attributed to Gabriele Valvasori, Algardi's successor. This fountain consists of a basin supported by a low wall perpendicular to the exterior wall of the villa. Near the entrance on Via Aurelia Antica, the basin is placed on a base which is reached by two steps. The wall is made of slightly raised rocale and is decorated at the upper edge with a stone surface, which at the two ends curves and then ends with two small pillars surmounted by a small sphere. In the center is the river deity, in Peperino, roughly carved in the typical semi-reclined position. Nearby we find Giardino dei Cedrati, so named because of the presence of numerous citrus trees. This place is already indicated in the 17th century plans of the villa as a place for apple cultivation. The garden, dedicated to the goddess Venus, was completely renovated by Gabriele Valvasori in the 18th century, with the construction of pots, fountains and perimeter walls, elegantly decorated with wrought iron gates. 
nearby is a second fountain, Fontana del Mascherone. Here, the French army fought against Garibaldi's Camice Rosse volunteers during the 1849 attempt to restore papal authority to Rome. The battle destroyed buildings and gardens, but spared the original Villa Vecchia and many fountains such as Fontana del Mascherone. Nearby were also monuments to the fallen French and the Arch of the Four Winds, the latter built on the ruins of the building destroyed in the fight of 1849. Villa Vecchia dei Panfili is also here. This is Rome's first civic museum dedicated to a historic Roman villa, whose birth and development is reconstructed from the 17th to the 19th century. This is therefore a territorial museum, illustrating the different contexts that followed one after the other in the villa, and which are still partially visible to the visitors. The current configuration of the villa dates back to the 19th century, when the cardinal was elected pope with the name of Innocenzio X. In 1644, the Panfili family grew in prestige and therefore needed a suitable residence. They left Villa Vecchia and moved into a gorgeous new Baroque building called Casino del Bel Respiro, designed by the sculptor Alexandro Algardi and landscape painter Giovanni Francesco Grimaldi. Between the stately garden that surrounds the casino and the Panfili family's old residence, Villa Vecchia, was a wooded area that included a large rectangular lawn for tournaments and games. Thus from here we cross Campo d'Apolo Villa Panfili and go to Villa Casino del Bel Respiro. Located in the Villa Panfili Park, the splendid building is also known as Casina di Allegrezze or dell'Algardi, named after the architect and sculptor Alexandro Algardi, who designed its construction together with Giovanni Francesco Grimaldi, beginning from 1644. The architectural masterpiece was commissioned by the Panfili family to symbolize their greatness, to house part of their art collection and as a place of delight. A boulevard decorated with Roman statues from the 1st and 2nd century AD leads to the villa in typical Baroque style. The facades are decorated with friezes, reliefs, stuccos and statues. The interior has a Palladian-inspired plan with two galleries of Costumi Romani, Roman costumes and Hercules, several holes and a central one that is double the height of the rest, decorated with stuccos, frescoes and classical sculptures. Outside is the delightful secret garden, transformed by Algardi into a place of delight, and the gem of landscape architecture, with hedges cut in the shape of a dove and lily, the heraldic symbols of the Panfili family. Evergreens and exotic plants, flowers, the fountain of Venus, and two romantic fish ponds on the sides, one of which curiously houses a bold cypress. Once the residence of nobles and cardinals, after it was acquired, together with Villa Panfili, by the state and the municipality of Rome, in 1967, the Casino del Bel Respiro is now the seat of the representation of the presidency of the council during the visits of heads of states and government. In front, there is a beautiful garden through which will take a stroll. We found a cave dug into the landscape, decorated with fake stalactites, two statues of mermaid and two of fawns, submerged in water. The Nymphaeum opens with three arches on a reservoir in front, formally constituting a small lake, transformed in 1849 into a ground floor, flanked by two side basins. The central arch of the entrance to the cave is decorated with two telemons. Then we find the theater garden, which takes its name from the large semicircular masonry etc., intended to host theatrical and musical performances in the open air. 
The excedra is finely punctuated by terracotta pilasters, alternating with niches for statues now gone, and ten marble reliefs set in brick squares, arranged like frames around stone paintings, in a sort of open-air gallery, decorated with ten busts inside the ovals. The crowning balustrade was once decorated with statues, then replaced with vases in 1849. In 1758, in the center of the Excedra, a so-called organ hall was created by Francesco Nicoletti, modifying a pre-existing room, housing a sculpture dedicated to Pan, to house a hydraulic organ. Unfortunately, the clashes between Garibaldi and the French in 1849 also destroyed this marvel. Walking through the garden, the funerary chapel, Capella dei Panfili, drew our attention. Built in the Neo-Gothic style, work on the chapel started in 1896 under the architect Odoardo Colamarini on behalf of the Prince Alfonso Doria Panfili Landi. The work was completed in 1902. A long marble staircase leads to the porch, decorated inside with stucco and with an upper area depicting the image of Christ. The building, with a plan in the form of a Greek cross, develops in height on two levels. Outside, in the upper part of all the cantons, the coats of arms of the two families are visible. The Pamphili dove and the eagle with outstretched wings, symbol of the Doria family. Above the portal, we find depicted the Blessed Madonna with Child Jesus. The figures are flanked by two angels. The back of the building has its own entrance to the funeral chapel, which leads to the basement. Here is a prothyrum decorated in the upper lute with a floral image on a green background on which the Cairo, the monogram of Christ, stands in the center. In the center of the theater garden, in the square in front of the Excedra, is the Cupid Fountain, probably built in 1855 by Andrea Bussini Vici, using pre-existing elements. The fountain takes its name from the Cupid, who stood in the center, of which today only the legs remain. On the base resting on a large circular cup with slightly wavy edges and decorated externally with garlands. The cup is supported by four pillars, on the external face of which are alternated two male and two female fonts. Below the cup, in the center, is an important rock kale. This base rises in the center of another circular basin, formed by a low brick wall finished with a stone border, adorned with 12 small rectangular pillars, decorated at the top with the lily, emblem of the Pamphili family. On the front face and on the two sides, the pillars are decorated with relief masks, from the mouth of which water emerges, which first collects into a shell-shaped tap and then descends into the basin below. In the center of the outer wall of the secret garden is the Fountain of Venus. Designed by Algardi and named after the statue that sat on a shell, pulled by dolphins that sent jets into a body of water below. From here, we'll go to Parco dell'Apia Antica. The Apia Antica Regional Park is the largest urban park in Europe and is a protected natural area of approximately 4,580 hectares, established in 1988 by the Lazio region. The territory of the park is a green area between the center of Rome and the Alban Hill, which represents the most important remnant of the Agro Romano from a historical, archaeological and landscape point of view. In fact, it includes Via Appia Antica and its surroundings for an area of 16 kilometers, including Villa dei Quintini, the Caffarella Valley for 2 square kilometers, the archaeological areas of the aqueducts for 2.40 square kilometers, and the Tor Fiscale and the tombs of Via Latina, the estate of Tor Marancio for 2.20 square kilometers, and that of the Farnesina for 1.80 square kilometers. The borders are to the north the Aurelian Wall, to the west Via Ardeatina and the Rome Casino Napoli rail line, 
to the east the district of Appio Latino and Appio Claudio and the Appia Nuova while to the south the park reaches the modern inhabited centers of Fratoci and Santa Maria delle Mole. At the entrance to the park, on the left side, we find the Dinfeo cistern, which was used to supply water to the Caffarelli farm. The Dinfeo Mavegeria, the spring and the surrounding construction can be dated from the middle of the 2nd century AD by reference to the type of brick used in its construction. Another cistern, a little further, is the Fianile Cisterna. The Caffarelli Valley is an alluvial valley created by the Almone River, still rich in water today, coming out of aquifers and springs. It stretches from Via Appia Antiqua to Via Latina and takes its name from the Caffarelli family, owners of the large estate that used to stretch across this valley. Today, the toponymy is also used to indicate an urban area located right in the valley. The name comes from the unification of the pre-existing estates carried out in the 16th century by the Roman Capelloli family. In the previous years, this family had grown to the point of owning an enormous estate that stretched from Rome to Ardea along Via Appia and Ardeatina, in the Roman countryside and included, in addition to the current Caffarilla Park, the estate from Valle Lata, Tufetto, Carrocetto, Campo del Fico and Casa Lazzara, acquired by notary deed on the 30th of March 1461 by Antonio Capelloli, who thus took them from the powerful Colonna family, who nevertheless maintained Ardea and political control over the whole of the southern Lazio and its centers. Caffarilla is currently one of the largest green areas in Rome and among the largest urban green areas in Europe, with an area of 132 hectares. In terms of building, there is the so-called Constantinium Columbarium, the Nymphaeum of Egeria, the Church of Sant'Urbano, alla Caffarella, several farmhouses, the most famous of which is the Casale della Vacareccia. We arrived at the Vaccareccia farm, which dates back to 1695. The Vaccarelli family sold the property to the Palavicinis, who in 1816 sold the property to the Torlonias, who restructured the Vaccareccia. The farm buildings display the family coat of arms, depicting a crown overlooking two comets. The building dates from the Renaissance period and is present in the Eufrosino della Volpaia map of 1575 and was probably built in 1500 by the Capelloli family. It is made up of a homogeneous whole created by overlapping structures of different ages. A medieval tower was incorporated into the farm, the tower built in the 13th or 14th century with tufa blocks and marble flakes was originally much higher to control the entire estate up to Villa Latina. The tower has openings on the first and the second floor of the farm, so although it is now completely empty inside, it could have been used after the construction of the farm for the connection between the upper and the lower underground rooms. The upper part of Vacareccia has a beautiful portico on ancient columns. From there, the entrance can be made to the farmhouse with a sloped roof and loggia of the 16th century in a single structure reinforced by robust support walls. From here, we go to the Nifeo di Egeria fountain, which was probably part of the water system of a nearby villa belonging to Herodes Atticus an agricultural estate dedicated to the memory of his wife, Anya Regila, which stretched from the Appian Way to the banks of the Almond River, called currently Almone. The Nymphaeum, which was built entirely above ground by digging into the natural bed and later covered with earth, was separated from the main body of the residential villa and was probably used for short stays away from the summer heat. Recent archaeological research has identified at least two main phases of construction, one during the 2nd century AD, when the current structure of the Nymphaeum was built to replace an earlier building of unknown purpose, and the second concerning the renovation of the building under the Emperor Maxentius. 
The original structure built in Opus Mixtum was divided into two main spaces. The first, where water gushed from a masonry pipe embedded into a natural bed, is a rectangular room with semicircular niches that house statues, and a masonry arch decorating the back wall, where a half-nude reclining headless male statue, probably representing the god Omen, sat. A channel carrying mineral water from nearby springs under Via Appia still feeds behind the building, just below the statue. A kind of vanguard divided into symmetrical wings, covered by a barrel vault and separated by a channel space opening towards the valley, was built perpendicular to the mentioned room. In the Middle Ages, the monument was abandoned and remained so until it was rediscovered in the early 1500s, when the building began to be studied and reproduced in drawings and prints by Renaissance architects such as Baldassare Peruzzi and Antonio da Sangallo di Young. The first archaeological excavation in the area of the Nymphaeum were to be carried out by Fea only at the beginning of the 19th century. On our walk through the park, we found Torre Valca. Torre Valca is a building of rectangular tough blocks and dates from the 12th or the 13th century. It was protected by a first defensive wall and a drawbridge. The tower is believed to have been part of a mill. From here, a little further, we find Columbario Constantino. The Columbarium is a building for housing the ashes of the deceased dates to the 2nd century AD and in the Middle Ages was transformed into a mill. The monument dating back to the 2nd century AD has a rectangular plan and consists of two floors with a brick porch, the latter being built in two colors, i.e. with yellow brick for structure and red brick for decoration. The walls of the building are preserved up to the roof, which was believed to have been gabled. The cell had a cross ceiling with an arcosol at the bottom between the semicircular niches and on each side wall is a niche, identical to the one at the bottom with a small canted window above and traces of the marble slabs that covered the niches still visible. The burial chamber was arranged on the lower floor as usual, with access on the long northeastern side, above which was probably an inscription in a red brick frame. Some archaeological studies have demonstrated the use of the building even in the Middle Ages, but with different functions, like a mill with a paddle wheel arranged horizontally. Between the 17th and the 18th century, a fire destroyed the building, leading to its abandonment. And from here, we go to the church of Sant'Urbano alla Caffarella, which is found on the edge of the Caffarella Park in the southeast of Rome, which was originally a Roman temple. In the 10th century, the structure was altered and consecrated as a church, and was later extensively altered in the 17th century. The original construction on the site was a pagan temple or perhaps a tomb from around 160 AD. It is believed to have been dedicated to Ceres and Faustina, wife of Antonius Pius, although an early historian, Pompilio Totti, it was dedicated to Bacchus. The land is on site formerly part of Triopio, an estate owned by the Greek-born Roman senator Herodes Atticus and his wife Aspasia Ania Regilia. The temple is believed to have been dedicated to Aspasia by her husband after her death at the hands of one of his freed slaves. The church was built inside a temple in the 10th century and was dedicated to Saint Urban, who was pope from 222 to 230. The interior frescoes were added in the 12th century. Often abandoned, the church was eventually restored by Pope Urban VIII and his nephew, Cardinal Francesco Barberini, beginning in 1634. Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte was buried here. The front columns are of marble, brought from Greece by Herodes Atticus. They were originally part of a portico, but walls were added between them during the renovation to provide stability. 
The remote position of the church meant that it was often subjected to acts of vandalism, and it was eventually abandoned. In 1962, it was annexed by the owner of the neighboring estate. The building was acquired by the city of Rome in 2002 and given to the Diocese of Rome and now serves as the rectory of the parish of San Sebastiano Fuori Le Mura. It was renovated in 2010 and 2011, open to the public only on Sunday mornings before the restoration. It was closed to the public in 2015, except for occasional guided tours. Walking through the park, we also saw a cistern, which according to the information that we found, was built in 100 AD. Originally underground, this cistern was exposed when the earth was removed for the nearby circus of Maxentius. In the park, we found the entrance to the tunnels under Rome, Sotterrani di Roma. The history of the tunnels dates back more than 2,000 years within the city, which grew into a metropolis of over a million inhabitants. In the early centuries of our era, the stock of rock was rapidly depleted. Therefore, in the first century BC, excavations began in the hills outside the city, which were formed by volcanic eruptions about 600,000 years ago. One of the largest quarries was Carriera, which covered an area of 5 kilometers, with overall 35 kilometers of underground passages. The carved corridors were abandoned in the 5th century. The catacombs can be visited, but the access is only possible with a guide, so you must book in advance if you want to do this tour. Unfortunately, we didn't know this, and since this is the last place we stopped at in Rome before leaving Italy, we didn't manage to see it. But we will come back here one day and take you with us on this experience. If you've enjoyed today's video, don't forget to click that subscribe button, leave a like and share this video with others. And as for us, we're leaving Italy for the north of Europe, and we will catch up with you in London, where we plan to do a few walks around the city and show you some places that we think you should visit when you're in the city. See you soon!